Let's go ahead and turn there and then uh, open up uh, with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your continued kindness to us. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for the benefits of the atonement that have been applied to our account. We ask that you might help us to honor you, to glorify you, to praise you. Help us to understand the passage in front of us that we might grow because of it in Christ's name. Amen. There is a story about a little old lady who challenged a scientist on the nature of the earth. The scientist had just given a lecture on astronomy, taking, talking about the roundness of the earth and how it orbits the sun and so on. The lady came up to him after the lecture and said, what you have told us is rubbish. The world is really a flat plate su- supported on the back of a giant tortoise. The scientist smiled and replied, what is the tortoise standing on? Obviously, it would have to rest on something, another turtle perhaps, and that would have to rest on another. He had her. But the little old lady would not be swayed. She replied, you're very clever, young man, very clever, but it's no use. It's turtles all the way down. You have to get to an end somewhere. You can't just reason from here to here to here to here to here to here to infinity. Every thought, every line of reasoning has to have an end somewhere. It can't be turtles all the way down, no matter what we're talking about. Why did the apple fall from the tree? Well, because of gravity. Why gravity? Well, because it's a law of nature. Well, why is it a law of nature? And you keep going and going and going and going and going. It has to stop somewhere. There has to be an ultimate reality somewhere that governs everything else in the universe. And today's passage is a, a lot like this. It's, it's almost like um, uh, dominoes falling into one another. Well, why this? Well, because of this. Well, why this? Because of this. Well, why this? Because of this. Why this? Because of this. Because of this. Because of this. But eventually, in today's passage, instead of it being turtles all the way down, we eventually reach a stopping point. We reach the, the grand purpose and design of all things. We get to the end of it, the reason for which we were created. We will work our way down in Philippians 1, 9 to 11 to a glorious grand finale. And that is the good news in the passage, is that there is an end. Um, And so let's look at this passage in front of us. Uh, Just a couple of verses here. Philippians 1, beginning in verse 9. And it is my prayer, remember Paul is talking here to the believers at Philippi, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve of what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. We're going to look at this in three sections. We're going to see the content of Paul's prayer the goal of the prayer, and then the telos. I have a parenthesis here, so we all know what this means, the end, okay? The word telos is a Greek word uh, that means the end or the the ultimate goal of something, the telos of the prayer. Beginning in verse 9 here, we begin with the prayer itself. Paul says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Now, if we were to break this verse down, we would see that, first of all, Paul is offering a prayer. Second, we would see the content of that prayer, that he, it is comprised of a request to the Lord about their love. And he prays specifically that this church in Philippi, that they would grow in their love for others, that it would abound more and more. And certainly, this is, of course, a prayer that all of us can get behind, Um, he's praying that they would love other people more than they do today. And this is something that we can easily pray for ourselves here at Crossview Church. I pray that you would grow to love one another more. You would abound in it and excel in it. Uh, This is really basic stuff. This is Christianity 101. Christians are known by their love for others. They are to abound in it. But as we kind of look at this in a little bit more detail, we'll see, first of all, that Paul uses the well-known and often referenced Greek word for love that probably, if you know 
No other word in Greek, you know the word for love, which is agape, okay? Agape love, okay? This word love is often understood, and obviously we understand that context determines the meaning of a word, but it is um, usually understood as a committed kind of love. It's, it's a love that is, has an enduring quality to it. It's not fickle. It's not unstable. Uh, it, it, it lasts. And it is significant to note that this word love, agape, is really the central virtue of Christianity. If we were to pick one virtue or one value or one attribute or one characteristic of the Christian that should be at the center of this whole thing, it is the characteristic of love. When Jesus, for example, identifies a single attribute that is the mark of Christians, he identifies the attribute of love. By this will all people know you're my disciples, that you have love for one another. We could say there's a lot of other commendable attributes that Christians should emulate, okay? But he doesn't say, by this will all men know you're my disciples, by the depth of your theological understanding, or by this or by that. He says, by your love for uh, one another. In addition to this, when Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is, he identifies it as, again, this virtue of love. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. Love for God and love for others. So great and so central is this attribute of love for the Christian that the Apostle, the Apostle Paul even identifies the attribute of love as greater than faith. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. When people talk about our church out in the community, they will say, I assume, lots of different things. I don't know. Uh, they may remark about Crossview Church has this stance on this issue or that stance on that issue. They may observe our theological convictions on certain matters. But what they should say at the center of all of it is, oh yeah, that's the church that loves others. It should be the central mark of our church. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus rebukes the church at Ephesus and says, you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Let this never be said about Crossview Church. We are called to pursue love with every fiber of our being. But there is something else I want us to see here, specifically in verse 9, about the attribute of love. Let's look at the verse again. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. What Paul is going to do in Philippians 1.9 is he is going to pray for the church at Philippi that they would be characterized by increasing love. But then he qualifies it. He says, I'm going to tell you what I mean by the word love. He wants it to be characterized by certain attributes. And specifically, he wants this to be the brand and variety of love that is characterized by knowledge and discernment. This is crucial. Um, we have to put this into perspective because the world is also talking a lot about love right now. In this cultural moment that we are in, the world is talking about love a lot. In fact, you may not even be able to turn on the news for more than 10 minutes before you hear this message of love. And so it's crucial for us to understand what Paul is saying here. The world encourages us to practice 
abstracted, indiscriminate, and undefined love. That's what the world is saying. When the world says love, that's what they are indicating most of the time. So, for example, if you encourage an individual to repent of their sin, many times you will be accused of being unloving. That's not love. Love accepts everyone as they are. You see how we already have two different definitions here. So if we're living in this moment where love is characterized this way, and we hear the Bible say love this way, we want to know what the Bible means when it says love. Um, So we want to be characterized by biblical love. Now, what I'm about to say might sound a little bit strange to some of our ears at first. But I'm going to say it loud and clear, okay? I'm going to say it, and then if anyone is uncomfortable by this, stick around because I'm going to explain what I mean by this, okay? We are to love others. We are supposed to discriminate in our love, okay? We are supposed to discriminate in the way that we love. You certainly discriminated when you got married. You said this spouse and none of these other ones, <laughs> right? You discriminated in that way. Uh, the OED, Oxford English Dictionary, defines discrimination this way, to serve to differentiate or to distinguish. Okay? This is a good thing that we ought to do. You discriminate in the mouths that you feed every single day. You feed your children and not your neighbors. Except for that one neighbor boy who always somehow gets to your table, right? But you discriminate. We're not saying you can't be generous and kind and giving and hospitable. All those things apply. But when it comes to your responsibility and what you do day in and day out, you discriminate that this is the family that I feed, okay? You discriminate in the church that you attend, You attend this church and not the one down the street. You discriminate in the entertainment that you permit into your home. You don't permit things that would dishonor Christ in your home. And so in truth, you already discriminate in your love. The goal then is to make sure that we are discriminating correctly. So how are we to do this? Well, first of all, our love is to be informed by what verse 9 says, knowledge. We are to have knowledgeable love or a knowledge-informed love. James Montgomery Boyce, speaking on this topic, says that love, about love, he says, this was never intended to be a wishy-washy, undefined, sentimental love. It is the love of Christ. Hence, it must be a love, and here's the key word here, governed. Governed by biblical principles and exercised with judgment. Chesterton said, love is not blind, love is bound. It has a direction, it has rails, it goes this way, but not this way. We recently saw some examples of this as I preached through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And in particular, 2nd and 3rd John, we saw uh, and spent a considerable amount of time on the topic of Christian hospitality. Remember this? Okay. We are to show, 2nd John and 3rd John were almost mere images in this regard. Show Christian hospitality to these people. Don't show Christian hospitality to these people. Okay? Um, We are to show hospitality, as John instructed us, to those who are advancing the gospel. But we are not to show hospitality to those who are false teachers. Okay? And you may recall in 2 John 2, or 2 John 10 through 11, John said, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching... Do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. You're supposed to discriminate in your Christian hospitality. If I were to uh, bring this person into my home, feed them, provide them lodging, I am aiding them in their mission to undermine the gospel. This is uh, what what we're uh, encouraged to do here in Philippians is biblical discriminating love. 
to show indiscriminate love is to help and aid those who would seek to tear down God's kingdom. You are feeding the very dragon that you are attempting to slay. And that doesn't make any kind of sense at all for the Christian. Therefore, our love is to be informed, first of all, by knowledge, in verse 9. Second of all, by discernment. Does anybody know where we can find knowledge and discernment? (laughs) There happens to be a book that gives us some instructions on things that are wise and knowledgeable and, and how to be discerning, okay? Uh, we get this knowledge and discernment from the Bible, not from <clears throat> culture or anything else, but from Scripture. Uh, scripture teaches us numerous ways in which our love must be guided, tempered, and informed by knowledge. Love goes in this direction, not this direction, okay? In the name of love, uh, for example, uh, uh, or you cannot, for example, show sexual love to anyone indiscriminately, right? There's a cert- it has to be guided in a certain way, the way that the Lord says this must be done. Uh, you cannot, for example, show love to others by giving to their financial needs if it means your own children starve, okay? Uh, We can be generous, of course, but Scripture puts an emphasis on providing for the needs of your own household and then providing and being generous to others. In the name of love, you cannot affirm the lusts of sinful men and women who would pervert God's law and pursue unnatural relations. In the name of love, you cannot neglect to discipline your children. In the name of love, you cannot take in a murderer and hide him from the law. Love is guided, love is filled with knowledge, and love is discerning, okay? We're not going to give all of the attributes of what love looks like. That's what the whole Bible is for, and that's what Bible studies are for, and that's what we do here every Sunday when we preach is we give direction and meaning to all of these kinds of things. But know at least at a foundational level that the love of Scripture is a love that is informed by knowledge and it goes in a certain direction, okay? Now remember, we are going somewhere in all of this. Where is this leading now? This leads to this, which leads to this. Domino falls this one to this one to this one. Well, Paul says, I'm praying for you that you would abound in love. But it's the kind of love that's informed by knowledge and it's discerning. And what does that lead to? Well, we have in verse 10 the words, so that. Right? This is kind of that connector. Verse 9 is connected to verse 10 with the words, so that. So we could ask it in the form of a question. Why should I abound in wise and discerning love? Why should I do that? Well, so that you might approve what's excellent. Verse 10. You see how this is <laughs> one domino after the next. You should abound in wise and discerning love for others so that you will approve excellent things. The word approve um, <clears throat> here uh, to make a critical examination of something to determine genuineness to put to the test or examine, to draw a conclusion about worth on the basis of testing, to prove or approve. This word approve carries the idea of investigation. I'm investigating to see what's excellent. Approving it. I'm testing. I'm discerning it. Other translations will translate this word as decide, understand, determine, or discern. This word was used to examine coins to see if they were real coins or counterfeit coins. And so we are called to examine and investigate and discern excellent things. What are the excellent things? Um, Well, first of all, at a basic level, what does it mean that there are excellent things but that there are not excellent things? Okay? Okay. And again, this is the part of what we're talking about with this brand of love. This brand of love is discriminating in the sense that it is saying this is wise and this is unwise. 
This is good, this is bad. Okay, It's informed by Scripture. It's not indiscriminate. It's not chaotic. Of course, the love of God was certainly not chaotic. He channeled that love in a direction on the cross. Okay, And ours is supposed to be the same way. What is excellent? Well, <clears throat> I could go on all day long talking about what's excellent. I'm going to give you a really short list. Okay, Here's some things that Scripture commends as excellent. Marriage, families, children, discipleship, respect for authority, self-control, hard work, confession of sin, generosity, responsibility. These are good things. I know they can be corrupted, but they're good things. What isn't excellent? Well, again, I can go on all day long with this. Uh, but we'll give a short list here. Things that are not excellent. Sexual immorality, laziness, chaos, disobedient children, disorder, pornography, addictions, blame shifting. Loving discrimination properly applied leads to what verse 10 says, approving excellent things. These are the excellent things. These are not. These are the good things. Said a different way, Knowledgeable and discerning love results in having a valid moral compass. The compass is pointing in the right direction. Uh, you know, some of those compasses, they have, you ever seen the compass? It has a little tiny, tiny screw, dry, screw on the side to adjust for declination. You know what magnetic declination is, okay? You get a compass out, it doesn't point to true north. The magnetic north is actually moving, okay? And if you get a topographical map, it'll show you this is the angle difference here versus here versus here. And you have to take that compass and that little screw and screwdriver and you turn it so that you adjust for the declination, okay? We want a compass, a moral compass, that points to true north. And that's what the passage is instructing us here is that uh, knowledgeable and discerning love leads to this. We need to approve of that which is good and disapprove of that which is evil. Bonhoeffer said, Where Christ, for love's sake, commands me to maintain community, I will maintain it. But where truth and love bid me dissolve community, there I will dissolve it, despite all the protests of my emotional love. That's a hard one to implement, but he's right on this. There is a time that we are called biblically to... Unify, and there is a time where we are called to, in the words of 2 Corinthians 6, come out from among them and be separate. Okay? And biblical discerning love knows how to navigate that. Okay? That's why he's praying that they would have this kind of love. Uh, we actually saw, by the way, to Bonhoeffer's statement here, the specific answer to this specific question on the hospitality issue in 2 and 3 John. Okay? In this case, you do this, and in this case, you do that. In the words of uh, Solomon <clears throat> in the book of Ecclesiastes, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And in Hebrews 5.14, we read, But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Uh, this is where we go to Scripture. This is what we're talking about, discerning. And by the way, uh, we yes, yeah, Scripture is our authority, but God works through means, okay? So here's what I mean by that. Find yourself a mature and experienced Christian here in this church who can help you navigate through these things because all of us face the difficult questions of what would love have me do here versus here. We need to be the people, according to this passage, who can distinguish good from evil. <clears throat> when we do this, okay, dominoes falling, I pray that you'll love and that it would be a wise and discerning kind of love so that you could approve excellent things. And then the next domino is falling, uh, so that, uh, in the words of verse 10, we would be pure and blameless for the day of Jesus Christ. 
you do this, then this will happen, then this will happen, then this will happen, and you'll be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. This is Christian sanctification. When you embrace Christian love that is filled with knowledge and discernment, you approve of excellent things that are pure and blameless. All this is in anticipation of the final day where we stand before the Lord. And then this leads to something else now. Okay? This leads to this, leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. And that is the telos of the prayer. Verse 11 says, Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. For those, uh, uh, well, first, those who are abounding in Christian love approve of what is excellent and are pure and blameless and are also, as verse 11 says, filled with the fruit of righteousness. See this progression that's going on here? Scripture talks about this kind of fruit a lot. Proverbs 11, 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Galatians 5, 22 to 23, this one is one that probably many of you have memorized. The fruit of the Spirit is what? All these things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Ephesians 2, 10, we know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, but what about Ephesians 2, 10? For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. This is supposed to be the fruit of our Christian life. Look at the word filled in verse 11. This is a verb, and this is a verb that is active or passive. Passive. Okay? Which means it's not saying you do the filling. Somebody else is doing the filling. Filled with. Who is the one doing the filling? Who is filling us with righteous fruit? This is so easy. This this verse answers the question. This is what I'm telling you. This verse is just like this to this to this to this to this. Who is the one doing this? That comes through Jesus Christ. (laughs) This hits on a theme that we've explored time and time again. Namely, that we cannot be righteous without the aid of Jesus Christ. And it's right here in this text. The fruit of righteousness comes through Jesus Christ. There's not, there's not two different plans. Like, hey, a great option for you is you could take the Christian track right here. And if you want to be a Christian, path to a great moral life. And, and oh, by the way, if that's not for you... The non-Christian track, this is a great option too, still leads to moral righteousness. You could go that way too. Okay? It no, doesn't work like that, okay? John 15, 4 through 5. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him... He it is that does what? Bears much fruit. Philippians 1, 11. For apart from me, you can do some things. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay? Nothing. Nothing means nothing. There is no alternate route to manufacturing righteous behavior. Some of you know uh, something that's kind of been an ongoing thing for us is that last year, late last year, the city of Orville had asked us some questions about how uh, to address and how we would address the drug issues going on in our own community. And in that response, that is somewhat ongoing, uh, we have emphasized the importance of faith and repentance toward Jesus Christ for salvation. Okay? This is not like, oh, (laughs) sorry, you're a neutral city, okay? So here's option B. You don't want the Christian route? Here's the option 
the other, the other route. Um, why tell a secular city that they need repentance and faith toward Christ? First of all, we're commanded to. That's, we don't really need any other reason than that. In Acts 17.30, we read that God commands all people everywhere to repent. Not just the religious-minded ones, not just this group or that group, all people. Also, because there's no other way. I don't have a, I don't have a backup plan to this one. There's no other path to morality that bypasses Christ. Now, this brings us to the grand finale, the conclusion of the matter. Fill with the fruit of righteousness, okay? Passive verb, fruit, comes through Christ. We can't get it without Him. To the glory and praise of God. <clears throat> the Westminster Confession of Faith um, gives to us the telos of man. Again, this Greek word telos, end, goal. What is the chief and highest end of man? What is, in other words, the telos of man? Man's chief and highest end is to what? Glorify him and to fully enjoy him forever. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And the angels in Luke 2 cry out, glory to God in the highest. So here's, uh, here's what the text says. Paul prays for the Philippians. He prays that they would abound in love so they would first approve excellent things so that they would be pure and blameless, so that they would be filled with the fruit of righteousness, so that God gets the glory. See, domino after domino after domino. Do you realize that you can follow that path with literally anything in the universe? Have you ever been doing work in your yard? Maybe you're digging somewhere, mulch beds or something, and all of a sudden you uncover like a rope or a cord or a wire or a cable or something, and so you pull it up, and then you end up spewing some of the dirt out, and you're going this, and now we're going this way, and now we're going that way, and you're kind of just following this all throughout your yard, you know, trying to figure out where this goes, and finally it gets to an end somewhere. Okay? You can do that with literally anything in the world, and when you get to the end of that, glory of God. Literally anything. Why solar eclipses? There's... There's one tomorrow, right? Unless you've been living under a rock, every single news organization and business and county emergency agency has been talking about the event that is coming tomorrow. Why, why solar eclipses? Did you guys see the thing, the whole like, I don't know, it's going through all these cities named Nineveh or something like this. Did you guys see that thing? Okay. If you didn't, count yourself blessed, okay? <laughs> all right. So we've picked up the end of our rope, and it's the solar eclipse rope. And we're pulling this up all over the place. Why is, what's the reason for this? Why, why is this part of God's universe? And we're pulling this up. Solar eclipses <clears throat> are evidence of an orderly universe, which is evidence of the uniformity of nature, which is evidence of an orderly lawmaker. And when you get to the end of the solar eclipse string, you find Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Why solar eclipses? Because of God's glory. That's it. 
Why marriage? I want to pick up that. Why apple pie? <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Why internal combustion engines? Why toothpaste? Why the Bible? Why angels? Why Satan? Why does light behave like a particle and a wave? Why the second law of thermodynamics? Why photosynthesis? Why frogs? Why oceans? Why paper? Glory of God, 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 glory of God. All of it. Every last molecule, every atom, every human being, every particle of creation, every law that you cannot see with your eyes, everything shouts God's glory. And that's what the passage teaches us today. I'm praying for this. Why? Because of this. Because of this. So that you'd have the, be filled with the fruit of righteousness. So that you'd be discerning. So that this would happen. So that this would happen. So this would happen. I'm pulling up, pulling up, pulling up. And I get to the end of it and it's glory to God at the end of the whole thing. That's why we exist. For no other purpose than to praise and glorify God. So where do we go from here? <clears throat> Let's look one more time at the progression. You have that <clears throat> outline in front of you, and I've tried to um, give some arrows here. This leads to this, leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. The purpose of the prayer is for them to love. The purpose of the love is for them to approve excellent things. The purpose of them approving excellent things is to be pure and blameless. The purpose of them being pure and blameless is to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. The purpose of being filled with the fruit of righteousness is to bring glory to God. The telos is not to live your best life now, to experience a good life, to avoid the consequences of sin, to feel good inside. They're not bad things, by the way. But that's not the telos, okay, of it all. Everything culminates with the glory of God. Our own happiness even, my happiness is secondary to this grand cosmic plan. Everything will culminate in the glory of God. And you will never thwart that plan. Yeah, I'll thwart that plan. I'll reject him. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. If you choose to reject Jesus Christ as Savior, you have not short-circuited God's plan to get glory. He will get glory, just in a different way. God will get glory through him displaying his justice by punishing you for all of eternity in a place called hell. Hell brings God glory. If instead... You repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Guess what? God gets glory there too. But instead of getting glory by displaying his justice, by pouring out his wrath on you, he will get glory by displaying his mercy, by being merciful to you and pouring out his wrath on Jesus Christ. Not going to thwart it. You will be part of the plan one way or the other. Hell brings glory to God. The lake of fire brings glory to God. Heaven brings glory to God. It all ends with the great cosmic plan to bring glory to his own name. He will succeed in that mission. He will bring glory to his own name. And we get to be part of that, to his glory. Four points of application today. Number one, pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ that they would abound more and more in love. Intercede to the Lord on their behalf. Devote yourself to meaningful and intentional seasons of prayer every day. Pray with others here in this church. We're, we're, fervent prayer. Okay, Pray for their love to abound more and more. Pray for your own love to abound more and more. <clears throat> That's number one.
Number two, pursue biblical discriminating love. Let your love be informed by the knowledge and discernment available in Scripture. Approve that which is good and shun that which is evil. Okay? You know the difference between these. Let your love be firm and committed, agape, not weak and unstable, not fickle. Okay? <clears throat> Number three, pursue holiness through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. That's important. Point others to their need for Christ, both for salvation and for morality. Do not seek to make yourself righteous in your own strength. Humbly depend on the Lord in prayer for spiritual growth, okay? You're not going to lift yourself up by your bootstraps. Finally, do all things to the glory of God. Let the exaltation of God's name be your highest priority and goal. Reject pragmatism and seek to honor God in all that you do. This is what God says. This is what I'm going to do. doesn't matter what anyone else says. doesn't matter what anyone thinks. This is the Bible. I'm going to glorify God like this. End of the story. That's it. Thank you, God, for your grace to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth uh, that is revealed to us in it. Help us to practice biblical, discerning love. Help us to honor you in that. I pray that you'd help us to have a mind to bring glory and honor to your name in all things. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.